All right, good morning, everybody. Can you guys hear me? All right. So luckily, not everybody went out drinking last night. You're saving yourself for the Red Hat party tonight, right? So um, awesome. So thanks for joining us. Um, uh, my name is James Labaki. I work in the, uh, the infrastructure group at Red Hat. Uh, this is uh, Brent Holden. He's the uh, chief field architect of the East in North America um, at Red Hat as well. Um, and so several months ago, we, we decided when we saw that OpenStack Summit was in Paris, we figured how in the world could we get our abstract accepted? And so we decided to put Docker and Kubernetes and Atomic in it naturally, right? Um, no, in all reality, uh, we're going to be talking to you about kind of our experience in trying to um, run all the Docker, uh, the OpenStack services in Docker, Kubernetes, and Atomic today. I'll go to the next slide here. Oh, perfect. Okay, so quick agenda. We've got a short amount of time. So first, we're going to start by outlining what the, what the problem that we saw was with, uh, with OpenStack services today. Um, we're going to talk about some of the current solutions that are out there and available. And then we're going to dive into some of the improvements we think that Docker, Kubernetes, and Atomic could provide. And then finally, we're going to end with a demonstration, a live demo, no less, right? So all right, so really important, I think, is is defining the problem. Um, you know, we, a lot of the sessions I come to, or a lot of the design summit sessions, it's very easy to just gloss over the problem and not ever, you know, if you don't define the problem correctly, you're never going to know what you ac actually need to solve, right? So important to establish what the problem is. So, you know, when you look at OpenStack, it's really a thing of beauty, isn't it? We come here, we look at all the, <laughs> all the uh, architecture, we say, wow, it's beautiful, it's block storage, I could deploy it, it stands alone, it's completely, you know, discrete and atomic, and everything works well. Um, and you have your beautiful private cloud. But uh, the reality is actually a little bit different. Um, what, what you find is when you deploy OpenStack, I mean, how many people love deploying OpenStack and managing the services, the lifecycle services? You love it? All right, we found the consultant in the room. <laughs> OK, so, um, so the problem is that the OpenStack services, they rely on one another heavily, right? And the dependencies are complex. So even within a single service, there's com complex dependencies. And then the dependencies between the different uh, services within OpenStack make it even more complex. You know, so example is, if I want to update Keystone, all my other services are affected by it. Um, and there's a lot of you know, magic that needs to happen today in order to make that happen. So we want to do this much more, much more easily. But how do we do that? Um, and the reality is that uh, you know, and this is not to knock OpenStack, right? This is not, OpenStack is not a beautiful and unique snowflake. Every infrastructure platform has the same problem. So um, in fact, at Red Hat, you know, we've seen this across a lot of other things as well. So whether it's our own you know, open source virtualization platforms, our configuration management systems that we use, content delivery, um, even you know, storage, uh, we see these same problems showing up, which is basically that any infrastructure services you're running that have dependencies on other infrastructure services end up becoming kind of a, a nightmare to manage and understand how you update the lifecycle of it. Um, and, and that's just the operation side. The developer actually has a bunch of problems, too, because you know, developers basically want a reproducible environment. They want to be able to know that um, they can get their environment the way they want it, and then when they give it to you, it works exactly the same. Um, they want a separation between the operating system and the application. They don't want to have to know that they have to run a particular operating system uh, when they deliver their code to you for this to, to operate. And then the third piece is that they, they, um, they don't want to actually deliver you um, a massive manual with their, <laughs> with their code for you to be able to get it running, right? Um, they just want to be able to drop you something that you could very easily take, deploy, and know it's going to work. So real quick, let's look at what the current solutions are for lifecycle management. Um, and again, this is not to, not to knock these, because a lot of them work really well. But th the question is, like, what, what are their deficiencies today, or where are they deficient? So you know, one of, the, one of the ways you can install OpenStack today is using like a build-based base system with configuration management. And so on the left-hand side here, you see you know, here's my build-based, you know, very high-level you know, build-based system. Some sort of lifecycle management tools with either using a workflow or a state machine with some or some decision engine tied together with a, a repository of content that you could pull from to do your builds. And then some sort of configuration management that's going to go modify the system once it's deployed, right? So there's really three main deficiencies that we've, we've seen with this. The first one is that it's, it's inefficient. So um, 
when you deploy genu generally with a build-based system, you're going to separate your OpenStack services onto different operating systems. And if you're doing this, you're typically doing it on bare metal, right? Because you don't want to deal with, with virtual machines, or if you do virtual machines, it can get pretty messy. So what happens here is OpenStack service A might only be using 30% you know, of its CPU, right? So it's kind of inefficient to put an entire service on there. What if that's just Keystone, CPU load's not higher, it's not using a lot of memory. So you don't want to do that. The second one is, is really that it becomes difficult. So if you do want to stack two OpenStack services in the same operating system, you have to know the dependencies between them. So for example, if I put you know, uh, Keystone on a server and then I put uh, you know, the Glance API there, Maybe they're going to use the same port. Who knows, right? I mean, both, both these projects are moving at speed. People are making changes. There's a chance for a conflict. Also, you don't know what kind of quality of service you're going to get from that, right? So one might impact the other. And then finally, the third one is that it's a kind of a slow deployment, right? You're pulling packages across. So at scale, you don't want to have to be pulling you know, each package one by one, right? So pretty, pretty, pretty uh, it's a, it's a good, good solution, but there's, those are the three deficiencies, kind of the build based uh, with configuration management approach. The second is, is image based, right? So you see these image based deployment solutions. Um, again, a good solution, but kind of two areas that they struggle in, um, even if you're using image based with sort of a declarative model, the two areas is that it's still difficult. Um, because at, at the end of the day, you're going to have some sort of image builder that's building this image. And when you're assembling that image, you're going to have to figure out how the OpenStack services get onto that image. And you, ha you basically face the same problem earlier on in your life cycle of building that image. So you have to figure out, can I layer Keystone onto here? Can I put this API on here? Can I move this? You know, how do these two s uh, services relate, and how are they configured on that image? So really, that becomes you know, kind of the, the same problem moved into an earlier stage. And then the second problem is that the updates are actually expensive. So if I have to push an entire image down to that system every time I want to update, that's kind of an expensive process. So I don't want to have to do that each time. All right. So with that, um, let's talk about uh, a little bit of kind of tomorrow's improvements. Um, so wh what if we were actually able to have a solution that was kind of isolated, lightweight, and portable, um, and pre-integrated, so that the developer could actually do all the work and then deliver it to the, the operator right, through some means, and then the operator could <coughs> deploy it? Also, if we could easily describe the runtime relationships, instead of me giving you, you know, thousands of lines of your favorite configuration management solution, uh, what if I could just very easily give you a declarative way that you could um, run this with kind of scheduling included and all that? And then third, what if I could run on something that was thin and easy to update so I didn't have this, uh, you know, giant operating system uh, underneath that, um, that, you know, took up a lot of space and had its own, uh, own challenges in managing? So for the, first, for the first part, for isolation, lightweight, and portable, and pre-integration, uh, that's kind of what, the, the, what Docker is meant to solve, right? So uh, quick show of hands, how many of you have not heard of Docker? OK. Even, you, so one person likes installing OpenStack and managing the lifecycle, and nobody's not heard of Docker. All right. So um, easily describe runtime relationships. So, um, Kubernetes allows you to easily describe runtime relationships, and it also allows you to schedule containers um, across uh, different systems. How many of you have not heard of Kubernetes? Okay, so a few. All right. And then um, Atomic is something uh, is, is something that is very a thin operating system optimized for containers with just what you need to run f uh, for containers, and it's easy to update as well. How many of you have not heard of Atomic? All right. It's like a, a pyramid, right? All right, so the goal is really to develop locally and uh, run in production with less friction. So developer develops, pushes it over, and you can run in production with lo a lot less friction. Uh, so real quick on Docker, um, I'm not going to, since basically nobody raised your hand, don't have to go into a lot of detail on Docker, I hope, on the introduction side. Um, certainly, you know, Linux container technology provides an API on top of Linux containers allows for a relationship between parent and child images and things like that. The key is that developers don't want to ship virtual machines to ops because they're heavyweight, right? You don't want to ship a whole VM. Um, the metadata, getting metadata out of VMs is expensive. You need to either keep some sort of agent on that VM or do introspection, which can get you know, very difficult. So they don't want to do that. Um, they also want to own the integration. So they want to make sure that the image they give you is already ready to go. So you could take it, run it, and it's pre-integrated. So I don't have to worry about runtime configuration as much. Um, 
And the third is that um, they don't want to learn your packaging format, right? They don't want to learn RPM. They don't want to learn Deb. They don't want to learn MSI. They, they just want to ship you their image. Um, so that's the benefit that Docker brings. Um, with Kubernetes and container scheduling, so um, this is just a quick overview of the, the, the kind of the Kubernetes uh, architecture. So there's, there's a master minion concept. So the minions are what actually will run your run uh, containers, uh, uh, will pull down Docker images and run containers, and the master is what does um, all the all the scheduling. There's a couple of services in here that are important. You got the the proxy service, um, which essentially uh, allows people to see your services externally, and then that actually plums down to the pods. And so the pod is actually a collection of containers running on the minion um, that all share a single uh, network namespace. And so um, there's a bunch of other services we won't, we won't get into in this, but you control it using the, the kubelet CTL commands down to the master, and then that will, um, allow, that will then orchestrate the deployment of the pods and the services. So services. Um, and Brent will get into this a little bit more in the demonstration, but um, services are what allow you to basically publish your, your containers to the outside world um, through a proxy service, and uh, pods are actually what allow you to define the, the deployment of the containers. Um, the other thing that Kubernetes provides is a declarative syntax. So, you know, instead of, you know, service Mongo, you know, MongoD start and go through all your steps, um, the, you know, declarative allows you to basically say, this is what I want the system to look like, uh, or what I want it to look like when I deploy it, and then Kubernetes will, will figure out how to deploy that. And, um, you know, I think that the saying that, that I've heard from, you know, the Google side, who, where they launch, you know, uh, millions of containers, I think, is declarative always trumps imperative. So I want to stick with a declarative syntax. And then, um, finally, we have Atomic. So, Atomic is um, really, it's a, it's a thin operating system that's optimized for containers. So it includes uh, Docker and um, Kubernetes and etcd to allow you to run that. It doesn't include a lot else. It's very thin and light. And it also allows you to update using new mechanisms uh, like OS tree. So you could rebase the OS very quickly. Um, you know, upgrades happen very fast. So those are kind of the three, an overview of the, uh, the three technologies there. All right. So we want to go through how this changes your life. Um, you want to take over, or uh, you want me to dive through here? Uh, okay. Ahead. So the so the from a developer standpoint, right? The goal here is that the developer, whether they're running on you know Linux or another operating system as their base system, they could very easily develop using their choice, right? So they could use their choice of hardware to develop. Maybe they're spinning up a Linux box on Vagrant in this example. It doesn't necessarily have to be on Vagrant. They could be using bare metal. Um, and then they're, they're just going out and using source control. So whether they're using Puppet or Chef to essentially build their images, um, they could use whatever, whatever configuration management language they want. Of course, there could be, in between them and Git, there could be a whole number of continuous integration tools, whether that's you know, the native tools that OpenStack provides or their own uh, you know, kind of CI, CD tooling from an, uh, another um, you know, platform as a service vendor, um, such as OpenShift. They could use that. So the great thing here is that the developer um, it, it gets easy access to their environment. They're able to very quickly um, deploy, uh, deploy their environment, and they're very easily able to develop, right? Then when they're done with their development on their choice of, you know, tr their choice of operating system, their choice of hardware, um, they could then publish. So really, the line of demarcation between developer and operations is the Docker registry. So, um, so what would happen is the developer is done with their changes. They would then push this up to the registry, and then on the other side of the, on, in the operations side, on the right-hand side, whether that's test, UAT, production, that could then be deployed via Kubernetes. And so, um, as we said before, those, those lifecycle management solutions, the build-based with configuration management and the image-based <coughs> with the declarative model, um, the goal here is that there's, and, and we haven't really figured this out, right? I probably should have said this in the beginning, this is all completely experimental, right? But on the right-hand side, um, on the right-hand side, there, there's got to be some relationship between Kubernetes and the deployment tools that exist today, right? So whether that's, you know, whether you're using Foreman or you're using, you know, Fuel or using Triple O or whatever it happens to be, right? Or Stack IQ, there should be some relationship between Kubernetes and the lifecycle management tools that exist today. Is what we're what we're trying to get at. So yeah, so the developer once he launches it, Kubernetes actually will take care of the deployment of the OpenStack services in the Docker containers, and then you have your, you know, working OpenStack environment there. All right. 
So, I'm going to hand it over to Brent. Time. Demo time. You guys excited to see the demo? All right. Ah, awesome. All right. Um, so, uh, we're going to make the mistake of doing a live demo today. Um, <laughs> so, yes, we'll, uh, we'll pull this over. All right. So, let's see. Yeah, let me get out of your way here. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, so first, move this over. All right, so I'm already on a uh, corporate VPN, so may or not. Can you guys see that in the back all right? Yeah, is this okay? Everyone can see it? Yeah, it'd all be right. a shame if I did all this work, you guys can see it. <laughs> okay, so, well, well, I guess first things first. So uh, first is, uh, uh, let's see. We want to show off uh, an environment that we built this in. So uh, to build this in an environment, uh, I happen to run an, uh, an OpenStack environment internally. One thing that we didn't really talk about so far is how, um, you know, where the demo comes from um, and where do we get all these bits from. So the, uh, the demo itself comes from um, an upstream project called Project Kala. Um, I'm sure some of you guys have heard that this week. Uh, project Kala is uh, basically uh, how the Triple O uh, project has created a subteam to then investigate containers in a way to then provision OpenStack services. Uh, so a lot of the stuff that I'm doing here in the demo today, in fact, all the stuff I'm doing in the demo today is replicated easily. Uh, all the documentation is upstream, and we can uh, yeah. uh, shoot you the URLs at the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, the idea being that even though I'm demoing on OpenStack today, today uh, you know, it's just an easy way for me to get a VM so I can show you. Uh, this is not the ideal use case. Most people do, know, do not want to provision OpenStack uh, within an OpenStack tenant environment. This is not a typical use case. Uh, so I'm going to uh, log into uh, my OpenStack environment just to get access to my VMs, and I'll show you where those VMs are coming from, um, some configuration parameters. Okay, so I have a uh, tenant I set up for Kala, so I'm going to move over to that. That's uh, a little slow. All right, here we go. All right, so we run a um, an environment very similar to uh, TriStack. So for all the folks in the room that are familiar with that, it requires a uh, tenant router with uh, associated ten tenant networking that's set up. I have a very simple master and minion setup, um, and uh, you know that's just a, it's meant to be a demo. So ideally, with Kubernetes, you'd have multiple minions uh, that you'd be able to deploy to. The Kubernetes schedule is not particularly intelligent uh, as of right now. It's just designed to uh, basically do a round robin between your minions when it's scheduling pods. And I'll go into uh, what pods are, what that is, uh, and what it does in just a minute. Uh, but just know that for the right now, I have a master and a minion. Minion is where all my Dockerized services are going to land. Okay, so let's see. Let's go over to uh, my instances. I've got some IPs here that I'll uh, share. So my master is on 1011.95.6, and I've got 95.7, which is my minion. Yeah. And just to, while he's SSHing in there, two things. So, you know, we're doing this on top of OpenStack. Certainly, you could just run this on a standalone workstation, too, if you wanted to get all the OpenStack services on, like, you know, Fedora Box or, uh, or otherwise. Um. I know you guys love text line demos. This is uh, OpenStack famous, I guess. Okay. And then. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to log into my master and minion um, just to demonstrate what's going on. So I think with, uh, with my master, what I'm going to do is... Yeah, caps lock. Uh, I have caps lock on. All right. This command will not work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm not running anything right now, um, and that's kind of the point of Atomic is that it's a platform you for you to land containers on. Uh, so the idea is that right now this, this machine is a complete blank slate. It's got, um, right now it's running a um, slightly modified image of Fedora, uh, but this also works on, on uh, Atomic as well, either Fedora Atomic or CentOS Atomic, uh, for those of you who want to replicate that. Okay, so on my master, um, I have Kubernetes installed. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, do kubectl list minions. And so you can see that it only has one minion registered. Um, and so what I'm going to do is uh, then kick off the process to then provision that. Like I mentioned, the 
Uh, all the stuff that we're doing is based on the project Kala that's upstream. Uh, this is a Git repo in StackForge, the Kala repo. Okay, so you can Git clone this repo. Uh, it has um, actually a really excellent uh, reference architecture for Kubernetes. So uh, for those of you who want to dive in, learn more about it, learn more about how services are constructed and how pods are constructed, uh, this is actually a great way to, to dive in and learn and to look at how someone else has done it. Uh, at least it was for me. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is, uh, let's see, tools. I'm going to kick off the process, uh, which isn't going to make a lot of sense right now. So you can see that you know, it's executed a bunch of commands on the master. And then, uh, let's see, I'm going to go back to my, uh, go back to my minion. Uh, you can see now that uh, it's starting to do things. Right? So Kubernetes is setting up these different actions. And so now I'm going to flip back to the presentation uh, and yeah. describe what those actions are. And then uh, after, ideally, three minutes, this thing will be ready to go, and we can show how OpenStack is functional. Cool. Yeah, and while he's switching back and forth, just want to uh, throw out to a couple people. So, so um, if you know, if you got questions about Triple O and, and that side of Red Hat, uh, Keith Basil's in the front. Keith, turn around, wave. If you got questions about kind of Foreman, Arthur Bergen's over there. Um, mm -hmm. He's from Red Hat as well. Uh, Hugh Brock is in the building. There's a hand over there. He didn't get in the door. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so he, so we found out he somebody one, somebody did go out drinking last night, uh, but uh, and then um, I'm trying to think who else is in the room. I see, uh, but yeah, definitely reach out to those folks. So yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, what we did here was we executed. Uh, I just did this the tool start. Uh, what that did was um, normally in the newer versions of Kubernetes, and Kubernetes is a rapidly changing project. Uh, I use kube config, but kubectl is the the new command. Uh, this start command executed kubectl. That's going to communicate with the master and tell my API server, hey, I want to execute these actions. These are the, the different pods and services I have defined. Um, that start command I executed, that actually executes three different commands. Um, one is to uh, create pods. And here, let me flip back to my master and talk about that. I mentioned how this is a great way to learn uh, Kubernetes. Just clear your. So what else is in here? So I've got uh, pods, replication, and services. So um, here, I'll go into the tools. I'll show you. Uh, uh, that's not what I wanted. OK, start. OK, so it starts all services. It starts the replications, and it starts all pods. Yeah. Uh, so if I look at what the uh, start all pods is doing, so right, right now, it's pretty simple, right? The start command wraps all these three, services, replications, and exactly. pods. And then it basically, those call the Kubernetes and, and uh, exactly. commands. Yeah. So um, project call as it stands today is not a complete implementation of the OpenStack services. Right now, we only deploy uh, Rabbit and Mariah is the foundational services that's actually required for OpenStack. But we're only really deploying Keystone Glance, um, a couple of Nova, um, so Nova controller, the Neutron controller, and Heat. Uh, Nova controller is interesting because um, what Kubernetes does is it allows you an easy way to break down these services. So Nova controller isn't necessarily uh, just one container that's running all these Nova processes. It's actually multiple containers that are going to get spun up that um, then expose their own uh, expose their own uh, binaries that run their own services. So Nova API, Nova conductor, Nova scheduler are good examples of that. Yeah. Um, same thing with uh, Glance, for example. Glance can be deconstructed to Glance API and the, um, uh, the Glance registry. Yeah, so each one of those is a discrete Docker image. And then the Kubernetes pod construct basically plums them together uh, through localhost on the same host. So basically, you'll see that there's a bunch of paused containers on there. And those will get plumbed together through there. OK. So now that I have my, um, now that I have my master has uh, been told and needs to execute things, it's going to look through its list of minions. Uh, the scheduler now is, like I said, it's, uh, uh, relatively dumb. It just does a round robin now. Um, but the idea is eventually that if you have multiple minions, let's say at the level of, I don't know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, I don't yeah. know what that scale limit is. Uh, but uh, you should ideally plug it into another type of infrastructure that knows the topology. And that's where the uh, Mesos and Kubernetes integration really starts and ends. Uh, so, uh, so for now, we just have that single minion. So it's going to tell that single minion, uh, communicates the cube proxy, and says, hey, I want you to. Um, start up these, uh, these different containers. I want you to start up C Advisor to then do the monitoring. And um, you know, we'll see how it goes. And so those Docker images that it's going to get from, all those are located on the, uh, the upstream Docker Hub um, repository. Uh, for today's demo purposes, I've pre-cached those uh, using a simple pre-pop script. 
So let's go back. I think, uh, let's see how our containers are doing. Yeah, so I think at this point, um, yeah, should no be done. The scheduler just came up about a minute ago. Yeah, so, okay, so in the time we've been talking, um, OpenStack has been deployed. Doesn't look obvious, uh, but it is running. <laughs> you can see all these, uh, all of my containers here. I can see that, um, yeah, I have Nova Scheduler running, uh, Heat API, RDO Glance API, um, Nova API, and so on. You see these weird, um, you, see, you might see some weird containers on the list too. I'm not sure if you see them here. Uh, there are these pause containers that Kubernetes will spin up. Uh, I'll go into why that is in just a minute. Um, but the idea being that Kubernetes sets up these uh, network namespaces, like James mentioned, uh, that's shared between the different pods. And that's important to uh, solving some of our problems in the future. OK, so uh, for right now, let's find the keystone. OK, so I'm going to sudo docker ps grep keystone. OK, so here's my, OK, I'm going to do a sudo. Uh, so I'm going to enter the container. So Brent actually has his monitor set up like this at home. So he's <laughs> he works like this all day for, it's very for, convenient. Pra for practice. This is very convenient. <laughs> 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 okay, so uh, so by default we set up some uh, default admin credentials. So we set up admin um, default password of Kala in the admin tenant. So that's what I'm going to use. So I'm going to source this. Uh, that's not going to work. Okay, um, so now I'm going to perform a Keystone user list. Uh, as you can see, that uh, yeah, that's pretty cool, right? <laughs> that's cool. OK, um, so Keystone works. That's great, right? But Keystone by itself, eh, it's pretty easy setup. Let's see how Glance works. So I'm going to break out of the Keystone container. Uh, I'm going to do the same thing, basically, for uh, uh, Glance API. So I'm going to enter this container. OK. OK, so I'm in the, uh, I'm in the Glance container. I'm sure you guys can see that. I have the same credentials that I'm going to use. Uh, same thing. Um, and actually, in this case, it's uh, glance and password for the admin tenant. Okay, so I'm going to source should that. You should clear your screen. I think there might be some. Uh, it's down the bottom. Oh, yeah. Uh -oh. You can't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's in the container. You can't all right, reset all right, that all right. terminal. Okay, so, uh, okay, so I can do a. File glance. that. File that RFE. <laughs> yeah, I'll get right on that. Right. Okay, so I can see uh, there's no images in glance right now because it's just spun up. Uh, I'm going to cheat for just a second. Um, and copy in a command. That way it'll make this go a little smoother. Okay, so I'm basically going to uh, retrieve my image. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, uh, so I'm grabbing the CROS image, and I just punch, pump that into Glance. Okay, so now I have a CROS, CROS image that's, uh, that's uploaded. So if I do a, a Glance image list. OK, so I can see that 0, 0 0.3.3 .3 is there. If I, because I'm in the Glance container, if I go into varlib uh, uh, Glance images, where you would expect for a local file system, now I can see that uh, same UID is present both. That's where my image landed. So it did communicate to the container, um, even though it's going to itself effectively, because I'm uploading it from the Glance container. Uh, that's how it would work from any other machine. So that's really it as far as, uh, as far as OpenStack. So now I have a fully, so my Glance container is able to communicate to Keystone. Uh, Keystone's running. Everything's able to communicate uh, to Rabbit because the Glance API uh, communicates to the Glance registry via the, uh, uh, via the AMQP message bus. And so um, that's how it worked. Yep. So uh, let's see, what else do we want to talk about? Yeah, I think uh, we got some. Uh, Towards the end of it, some of the some of the some of the challenges and moving forward and all that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, first, you know, just let me. Uh, okay. So we have a working OpenStack installation, and that's great. I love working OpenStack. But you know, at the end, uh, this is not a good deployment model. Or maybe I want to take this machine and uh, rebase it to just the blank slate it started with. So doing that type of action with Puppet. Uh, is very painful, as many of you are aware. You might as well nuke the machine from orbit, start fresh, re-kick the machine. Um, but in this case, uh, what I can do is I can do my, uh, I'm going to do tools stop. Um, what this is doing is it's telling the master, I want you to stop everything you're doing, all the services, all the, um, all the different actions you're performing. And um, on this guy, on my minion, I can say this. Saying one. Uh, 
Okay. So I can see that those, those uh, containers are starting to spin down. So they're not going to exist in a few seconds. So this machine is going to be in exactly the same state it started um, at the very beginning of the presentation. So that's pretty cool. That way, if I, um, if I did want to do something else, like I wanted to um, you know, deprovision a certain pod of services and reprovision them onto another one, uh, that means that they get deprovisioned here and they'll get reprovisioned somewhere else. It's a very powerful message of containers where doing that in the, uh, the puppet-based world is a very complicated and difficult action. Yeah. To or if it's, and if it's image-based, it's very, uh, very expensive push that new image down. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, so let's go back to uh, let's back to the presentation. We are very brave oh. for using Google, aren't we? I know. Straight <laughs> to Google. We trust uh, the internet here. <laughs> All right. Uh, so some of the challenges that we encountered while, while creating this project, and keep in mind this project is only, um, it's only been around for roughly a month. It's been yeah. less than a month, and that's all the work that we've accomplished. We've yeah. been able to get a. In fact, I, if, if you've contributed to Call stuff, I don't know if any of the guys are in here today. Can you raise your hand? I mean, they might be in the hall. Oh, there's I Lars. Stan. Yeah. Lars is there. Stan. Great. So, yeah, the, just a couple guys, you know, one, two week sprint. This is like milestone one, so yeah. um, just to get things running. Right. So, it, it's amazing how far this project has come in a very short period of time. Uh, not only getting uh, the stuff Dockerized, which I think is probably um, one of the easier parts about it, but then also getting the, uh, all the Kubernetes services described and getting that tested. Kubernetes is very rapidly evolving, so even differences between you know, 0.3 and 0.4 yeah. or... You know, You'll like notice it was kube config in our diagrams, and it's changed to kubectl since. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, so some of, the, um, some of the major challenges that we ran into were around external connectivity. Uh, so we didn't demo uh, all the services that we provisioned were um, services that are more or less outside of the data path, maybe with the exception of Glance. Uh, you have um, Keystone, Nova Scheduler, Nova API. Those right. aren't necessarily within the data path. Um, the things that are within the data path are very complicated. So things like um, the L2 agent, L3 agent, uh, Nova Compute, uh, those types of services, you can provision them via containers, although it does have its own set of complications. And uh, during the design summit yesterday, yesterday afternoon, it was really the debate of, you know, is this even a problem worth tackling? Uh, so we think it is. I think it's a great idea. Um, but it has its own uh, rat's nest of issues. Uh, Multi-host networking, uh, same types of problems where, um, you know, even within, the, uh, even within Kubernetes, when you start spinning up multiple minions, uh, they need a way for these um, atomic hosts to communicate to each other. Uh, in this demo, you couldn't see it because we're not using it. Um, Lars created this tool called Link Manager. There's other tools out there called like Weave, for example. Yeah. Um, people are trying to solve that problem of how um, build the overlay hosts basically build overlay networks between exactly your, between, between the hosts. hosts. Right. Um, the privileged container model. Uh, so Kubernetes does have an understanding of privileged containers, although um, it's got some limitations now. I'll, I'll right. keep it simple. <laughs> um, uh, the runtime configuration. So certainly, um, you know. A, comment I hear all the time from my customers is that they want to get those open stack services outside of the data path. Um, they want to hook them into, maybe it's an SDN, maybe they won't hook Glance into S3, um, you know, problems like that. And uh, that type of runtime configuration doesn't exist yet in Kala today. And, um, and even, and just to quickly expand upon that as well, all the, basically what was happening is when those Docker images were starting, they were pulling environment, environment variables that Kubernetes was passing into them via etcd, right? So yes. all of that that entire area needs to be kind of more deeply investigated as the best way to do that because we don't want to, you know, we, we want to work within the OpenStack community's construct, not uh, necessarily impose anything on it as well. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, certainly persistent storage uh, is a big issue. Uh, <laughs> just using uh, container volumes does not solve the problem of persistent storage. Persistent storage is not solved by a volume. A volume is just meant to uh, separate the running container from that particular set of data. Um, then the idea with volumes is that you have multiple containers that are looking at that same piece of data, and the volume goes away when the last container goes away. Uh, so that doesn't necessarily solve the persistent storage problem. Uh, chances are, if you are deprovisioning, uh, let, let's say MySQL is under load, you want to provision it somewhere else, uh, chances are you don't want all your data to go away as well. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that, that would be a major problem. Um, the monitoring and logging piece is also something that I think is, in general, a major operator problem that um, most uh, open stack operators face. Um, we use C Advisor for the basic um, the basic container functions, and that's built into Kubernetes how it will do that. Uh, but as far as um, you know, using containers with things like Supervisor D, uh, Supervisor D is is great. You can start up multiple binaries within a container. Uh, but as far as monitoring goes, you only know if Supervisor D is running. You don't actually know if your binary is running. Um, so 
even at the container level, there are, are monitoring issues, and there's also the typical uh, OpenStack service availability uh, monitoring issues as well. And it's also early days for Kubernetes. Uh, I can't really uh, stress that enough. Kubernetes is very uh, rapidly changing. Um, it's a lot of uh, new code that's being dropped. I, I mean, we're, we'll be in IRC, and we'll say, hey, I, I committed this you know, uh, git commit today that, uh, that fixed this particular bug. <laughs> and so I, that, that's kind yeah. of where we're at right now. Yeah. Um, so I think Kubernetes has a very bright future, although it's still uh, very early days. And I think uh, it's very representative of uh, yeah, how far it's come. It, it was only released, um, was it the summer? Yeah. Right, earlier it's this summer. Um, so. OK. Um, I mentioned all the all the stuff we're doing is all upstream. It's important for Red Hat to do things in an upstream, transparent way as much as we can. Um, so I mentioned earlier that um, it's Project Kala. Here's the blueprints for Project Kala. You'll see all the different things that we're working on. Uh, Project Atomic, um, the stuff that Lars has written for Heat Kubernetes that makes it easy to provision um, those types of images, uh, like I did in the uh, demo today. The uh, Kubernetes stuff upstream is hosted on Google Cloud Platform and uh, Docker IO. You know, they have their own Git repo. Yeah. yeah, so the Design Summit session, we were going to invite you to it until we realized it was before this right. presentation. So just go read the notes instead. <laughs> um, and uh, definitely jump on IRC in the mailing list. <laughs> Absolutely. OK, um, so I just want to very briefly cover, I talked earlier about those, uh, those challenges around um, uh, doing networking within containers. Uh, more or less, the, the challenges that we ran into were uh, you know, the, the L3 and L2 agent interaction is very complicated. They really do need to be singing from the same sheet of music as far as the, the host networking goes. And um, you know, when a default Docker configuration, when we first started investigating this, you're going to get your own um, process namespace as well as your own net namespace for every single container you create. And that creates a lot of complications when you try and take um, the container and put them into, uh, try and take the, the networking model and put it into a container. Because what you end up with is multiple models running in each separate container. They're not talking uh, the same language to each other, and so they're not going to interoperate, and nothing works. Uh, so uh, you, you would not do this. Why would you do this? OK, so, uh, so with Kubernetes, uh, it has a really unique property. I mentioned earlier that it has the ability to uh, deconstruct services really easily. The reason it does that is because it creates a shared network namespace. It's a really cool uh, feature of Kubernetes where um, you can then create these different containers where they're able to look at the same um, networking properties. So you're able to get isolation of the individual OpenStack components within the service but then you can still you know, get them to talk to each other on a single host very easily. Exactly. So uh, for things like um, uh, the networker node, which people are familiar with, where you're running the L2 agent, the L3 agent, you're running uh, OBSDB, OBS vSwitchD, um, you know, all those things need to be really deployed as a pod. They need to share the same namespace. Uh, but the idea is that it's possible to do this. this. This slide is maybe a little wishful thinking. Right now, Kubernetes does not have the ability to provision multiple uh, interfaces. Um, but the idea is that you could take uh, um, you could take multiple containers and have them uh, look at the same network properties. Yeah, so just real quick, slides are available uh, there. So if you want to uh, pull them down, uh, you could do that. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we're going to take some questions now. Yeah, absolutely. We've got uh, three minutes left. So if you have any questions, uh, please go ahead. Fleet, yeah, fleet, yeah. So, um, so the stuff we're using here, I think James mentioned very briefly that uh, Atomic includes etcd. Yeah. So we are using etcd under the covers here as well, uh, right? Yeah. Um, so some of those are common components. Uh, fleet is just another scheduler, um, yeah. and you know we just uh, Red Hat partnered with uh, <laughs> Google to release Kubernetes and solve problems that Google is seeing based on the scale that they're deploying at. Uh, it's basically two ways of solving the same problem. Uh, we think that Kubernetes has a uh, brighter future. Um, in the front, please. So yesterday, uh, there was kind of a similar approach from IDEA. Have you attended? Yes, I did go to yeah. that talk. Yeah. So there are kind of, I think there's 46 terms by the OPSD compared to Europe. Mm -hmm. So just wondering uh, how easy or how difficult is it to set up your installation framework? <laughs> Right, so um, the, the IBM talk, um, I, I went to it yeah. yesterday, I'll, I'll speak to it. Uh, so the IBM talk was focused more on, um, you know, uh, very focused on Docker, Dockerizing services, and then creating a lot of custom hooks and scripts that do a lot of actions, and then their front end was based on Shipyard. And it was a cool solution, I gotta admit. Uh, they have, they're very UI based. Um, Kubernetes is very API based. 
So we think that Kubernetes has that advantage. Um, and we also think that Kubernetes has uh, a lot more robust features. When I talk about like how it does that shared network namespace stuff and how it sets all that up for you, it has a concept of pods and services. Uh, that's stuff that you're not going to get from uh, the types of web interface that Shipyard is providing. But also to jump on that, I mean, I think there's going to be multiple ways that people are going to leverage containers across OpenStack. So getting a common understanding of how everyone can build them the same is a good idea, right? And then anyone can plug in whatever deployment mechanism they want as well, right? So yeah. while uh, while the Kala project's providing Kubernetes templates, right, certainly if somebody wanted to come along and provide means by which they could deploy in other fashions, I'm sure, you know, that's no problem. Yeah, exactly. Um, are there any other questions? I think we have time for one more. One more. Um, gentleman in front here. ETA on Atomic? I believe it will be next or next year. <laughs> 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 next year. <laughs> Can't get more specific than that. Okay, um, um, and that's all the time we have, folks. If you have any more yeah. questions, please come and see us. Appreciate yeah, you coming. You. Thank you.